This is Geeks of the Valley podcast. My name is Kanal. And my name is Roshan. Welcome to Geeks of the Valley. We connect with some of the brightest minds globally who are leading their respective industries today to discuss some of the hottest upcoming industry trends and how their work is affecting the global economy. Today, we have a fascinating personality uh, who is a venture partner at Contrary Capital, one of the largest co-led student-run uh, VC funds out there. Keegan McNamara. Keegan, how are you today? Thank you for joining us. I'm doing well, guys. Thanks for having me on. So, Keegan, um, if you could kind of get into a little bit about your background and tell us about how it all started for you um, uh, to where you are today and, and tell, just quickly, you know, run us through that aspect. Yeah, for sure. So, I guess it really starts um, back like freshman year of high school. I was able to get a, an internship doing doing like front end development at a at a small startup in Denver, Colorado. I'm from Boulder, Colorado, born and raised, um, and that that sort of just shot me into the the business world in general, I guess, and tech and startups. And uh, ever since then, I I did a few um, design internships, and then throughout college, did internships at Amazon, and then um, a couple other small like side gigs for for startups doing development stuff. And then Amazon, I did research science one summer and then just regular software engineering uh, one of the other, su- other summers. And I guess throughout my life, I've just had that sort of interest in startups ever since, ever since the beginning of high school and um, in college that, that sort of culminated with Amazon and then also uh, just trying to build like technical background. Uh, and in addition to that technical background, I think it's really important to cultivate business skills and sort of explore the the other side of the aisle because there's a lot of different facets that are required um, in founders to make companies work. Uh, And the best avenue for that uh, for me seemed to be working in VC and getting exposure to a bunch of really cool uh, student founded startups. So uh, contrary just sort of popped out as a, as a wonderful avenue to do that. So I applied and got in and it's, it's been a wonderful, a wonderful experience uh, over the past couple of years that I've been involved. I bet, I bet. Um, and when it comes to, you know, focusing on the aspect, just quickly on contrary capital, what were uh, some of the, you know, fascinating startups you might have looked into uh, or uh, seen uh, while, while there? Some of contrary's capital comp or some of contrary's um, portfolio companies are super interesting. So obviously, like, just to give you sort of a, a general background, we primarily invest in... Um, companies that touch the university ecosystem. So that can mean companies founded by uh, people who are in school or professors or um, even like recent grads as well as another common one. So we've kind of gotten to see companies across the gamut um, at Contrary, uh, again, ranging from, you know, kids who are just grinding away in their dorm rooms to professors who are doing uh, research level technology um, and trying to commercialize it. So it's really hard to like pinpoint one in particular that, that stands out as extremely interesting, but uh, some of the some of the tech in specific that I've seen um, has been really interesting. And when I say tech, I mean like very high level research oriented stuff. Uh, one example of that is um, a company that used to be called Hazel Biosciences. So uh, they develop synthetic muscles, uh, which is like a very interesting thing. It's like essentially pouches of a special solution. And then when they run current through that solution, electrical current through that solution, um, the muscle bags sort of like contract in a, in a way that mimics uh, human muscles. So that, that was definitely one whose technology really stopped me and um, they're looking to commercialize pretty soon. And then I guess in sort of like the more soft tech side of things, uh, there was a company um, that was started by a couple of guys who were Harvard and Williams college dropouts uh, called board. And what board did was essentially gave cash up front uh, to people who are looking to make mortgages. So the mortgage market is extremely competitive nowadays. Um, and it's really hard to, to actually nail mortgages on competitive houses unless you're making cash offers. Um, and obviously that's completely infeasible for the vast majority of the population. But board was uh, basically pre-vetting um, people who are interested in, in starting mortgages and then 
backing their their offers on houses with cash and then they would just the the homeowners would repay um their mortgage to board as opposed to a traditional lending service um and so that that was one of the more innovative like real estate soft tech side of things that i've seen Um, very interesting um the the one thing would be you know when it comes to looking at the investment thesis of contrary and thank you for detailing that uh what would uh what is your investment size look at when you invest in a company whether you know is your pre-c 250 to half a mil um what percentage of equity do you guys set uh that you usually take into these companies for you know entrepreneurs out there that are interested in being like hey you know i'm a college student i want contrary capital to maybe invest in me um what would be the steps they should take and and what deal size are they looking at yeah so um we have like a typical sort of investment uh, size and that's usually 50 100 or 250k at a two mil cap so that's like mm-hmm. two and a half five or ten percent respectively um and again this is for yeah primarily pre-seed companies people who have ideas and perhaps a few customers um maybe a product built out in a solid team but really haven't raised any any sort of capital before and need that initial money to to really devote all of their time to it we know that as student founders um it's hard to sort of askew classes and your other commitments in order to really focus on something and giving capital often enables that to really occur. So that's one of our primary um, value adds, I guess I would say, is just like giving people the motivation they need to actually pursue something full time. Um, but yeah, those are, the, those are the typical investment sizes. Uh, if anybody is working on anything interesting, you can feel free to just shoot me personally an email, uh, Keegan at contrarycap.com. We have contrary venture partners at a bunch of different universities across the nation. And if you're a student founder there, there's a pretty high likelihood that, um, that there are venture partners at your university. Um, so if you go to contrarycap.com forward slash team, uh, you can search for your school and then, um, find the respective venture partners that are at your school. So, um, either reaching out to me directly or to the venture partners at your, at your institution are two really good avenues um, for getting in touch with us. And then I was just going to add on as well that although our typical check size is 50, 100, 250 K um, we also do invest beyond that. And then we also are flexible on cap. We just like to keep it um, pretty standardized most of the time. So, yeah. Okay. Cool. No, very nice to hear. Thank you for that. Keegan, is there anything interesting that you're you're working on in regards to a startup right now? Just because, you know, there's there's you kind of see two flows of things. It's either you start as an entrepreneur and then you jump into being a venture capitalist, or you go the other way around from being a venture capitalist to an entrepreneur because you pick up an entrepreneurial bug. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, part of being a contrary that uh, has been really really awesome is just that. Uh, getting to talk to and be around uh, really ambitious young founders um, has sort of sparked in myself as like another young person, a desire to, to found something and uh, really take a podcast or not, sorry, take take a product through the ringer and uh, go through the entire, the entire process of of doing a startup. Um, So the project that I'm working on right now is called allowed. And at the moment uh, it's just a subscription newsletter where people pay Uh, $10 a month in order to to get access to uh, a weekly email where we send out three, three of our favorite articles of the past week um, that have been narrated aloud. So we select three articles and then narrate them and then plop them into an email and then send that out to people uh, who pay for it. Uh, And eventually uh, this is, this is sort of an alpha product right now um, just to gauge market interest and test our, or sort of hypotheses around around the state of audio and, and this this product in general. Um, but eventually, if it does end up becoming successful, uh, we plan on transitioning to more of a venture backed model, um, sort of using like an Audible type subscription process where uh, you pay like thirty dollars a month in order to get access to four or five credits, and then you can use a credit uh, in redemption for. Uh, an article of your choice or a blog post of your choice to be read aloud and then delivered to you in, in sort of a podcast like format. So there'll be, there'll likely be an app um, where you can just enter the links of articles that you want read aloud in exchange for credits. And then we'll have a professional narrator um, narrate the, narrate the audio to the, to the article and then deliver it to you 
uh, in the app. Um, and that's, that's sort of, again, like further down the road, uh, assuming, that, assuming that we get good validation from this initial email newsletter product. Um, but one of the core thoughts here is just that uh, there's, there's gap, there's a significant gap in the market between something like a podcast and something like an audiobook. Um, right. Podcasts mm-hmm. are, you know, very conversational, much shorter, whereas books are, or audiobooks are literally just the audio read aloud of, of books. So the ideas are harder to understand and is a bit denser overall. And we think that right in the middle sits something mm-hmm. um, just like aloud where articles and blog posts and traditionally untouched by audio um, pieces of writing can can be converted into that form and then made made very accessible for listeners. And one of the core pieces of data that that we found when we were doing customer interviews earlier on is that the vast majority of people prefer listening to audio over actually reading something. Um, so we we hope to to sort of confirm that that piece of data that we got just through interviews um, and see it reflected in the demand for for a product like this. But uh, yeah, I think that no, I I, I yeah. I was no, just I... going to say that audio products in general are fairly interesting to me. There's something very primal about um, communication via sound that I think that I think people have really missed out on. And writing is weird. It's sort of like a hijacking of a bunch of different parts of your brain uh, for a purpose that that they're not really designed for. Um, whereas audio is is much more ingrained in our biology and how we communicate as, as sort of a species in general. So I think that there's a there's an interesting vertical uh, and a lot of a lot of potential products still to be explored in the in the audio space okay no fanta- fantastic what a fascinating idea keegan i mean the, if people want to reach out to you on this idea and want to discuss more in detail about this product and what it is how do they how do you suggest they best reach you through your contrary cap email or um uh, yeah. what do you suggest yeah contrary cap email works well um i'm very responsive on there considering i see deal flow through it so you yeah, know feel free to reach out there excellent awesome um well you know there was one aspect in the conversation i wanted to run back to and just detail on is it's very fascinating to see that uh you really focused on the aspect of ensuring that you really uh are able to connect with the customers and ensure that uh, whoever is consuming your product, that you're seeing and testing your MVP with them to see what feedback uh, they would give back to you. Um, is there a reason why you decided to tackle it from that perspective? Yeah, I guess um, that's an interesting question. So coming from VC, uh, when it's sort of like seed stage, early stage, typically what we invest on is team primarily. Um, the quality of the team is is a really strong indicator of uh, performance in the long run. Um, when you get to later stages, obviously market and product become significantly more important. Um, but early stage, you typically worry about the team first and foremost. Uh, whereas, so so for this product that I'm building, um, I have confidence in the team just by virtue of me selecting the people that I want to work with on it. Uh, so I don't need really that, that. And then instead, I think that market becomes the, one of the really important things, it's sort of like, you know, if you, if you create a really poor product in a really terrific market, the odds are still high that you'll see success with that product. So I think one of the, one of the core components of just starting a company, um, once you have the team figured out, is ensuring that the market is what you think it is and that um, it can support the product that you, have, that you think you've come up with. Um, so that's, that's sort of like a core investment thesis that I have. That, that I've transferred over to to more of the product side of things. And yeah, I mean, in terms of gauging the market, like there's no better way to do that than um, talking to either potential customers or people who are actually using what you have. Um, so I think, yeah, that's, that's just like sort of a porting over of my investment theses to the product side of the world. But that's a great question. Yeah, thanks for... Thanks for mm-hmm. sharing like kind of your thought process of how you go about these things, because I think entrepreneurship is increasing um, all around the world, but there's a lot of people who are still kind of lost about 
uh, the next best thing to do. Or a lot of a lot of them, uh, you know, sharing stories like yours and methodologies like yours, kind of reminds people of, um, you know, the the core principles behind like success in startups. Uh, because nowadays it's like very quick to, um, you know, spin up different sites and and different things like that. But but I also wanted to ask you kind of your perspective as we kind of wrap things up here on. So like being involved in contrary capital kind of, I guess, would you say helped you break in to the VC industry? Because I know something that's been a hot topic right now is um, a lot of established VC firms out there or like, um, you know, entrepreneurs leading VC firms. Some of them believe that in order to break into the VC industry, you need a lot of experience. And we're sort of seeing this other model that you're involved in where you get uh, more responsibility and exposure earlier. Yeah. Um, I think that both models are interesting. <laughs> the The model that I'm involved in obviously has been extremely advantageous to me just in my career because I've been able to learn a ton up front and leverage that knowledge. Um, so I, I do like, I do like the model that contrary has used more than I like sort of the, the traditional approach where you have to go off and, you know, be successful in business and only then can you invest. I, I think there's merit to that idea just because you do learn a lot in founding. Like even in my fledgling company, I've, I've learned a ton about um, how to, how to make things work and then how that can translate into potential companies that I would invest in in the future, just by analyzing sort of like their operations and how they've gone about creating a product and how they run their company. Um, so I think there is, definitely something to be said for going off and doing something and then investing. But at the same time, a lot of bootstrapping can be done just by like reading or talking to people that have done this before. So contrary is organizational structure is weird. There's a few people at the top. Um, their names are Eric, Eric Tarzinski and Will Robbins. Um, they both know a ton about investing and have sort of been through the, the ringer in terms of starting companies. And then they've offered up their knowledge to the rest of the venture partners. So like me and all the, the other people that are at our respective universities um, to sort of like learn through what they've already done so that we don't have to go back and redo everything that they've done just to get to the point um, of knowledge that they're at, right? So, so leveraging existing knowledge and then also just like, although firsthand experience is great to hear from Eric and Will, it's also really important to read um, and understand many other people's perspectives. I think that although there is more to the, to the classic approach of like going out and doing a bunch of stuff and coming back to investing, I think that you can skip a lot of that just by getting knowledge from people who have already done it through the form of, you know, like talking to them and then also just reading straight up. So, uh, yeah, I guess that's sort of my take on the two approaches. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I, I think for, for sure the benefits of being involved earlier and getting exposure is more beneficial, I think, in terms of just giving uh, people like yourself more opportunity uh, because venture capitalists um, is this industry that's capital, but it's like locked into a certain group of people or, you know, that wealth really isn't being redistributed much. Um, I personally have been seeing a lot of uh, people who have, I, I think just the um, the ex-co-founders of, of Twitter started like a fund for $2 billion. So we are seeing a lot of people starting funds and uh, having their own ideas. But uh, I guess to, to kind of close it out, what would you say is some of the trends that you're seeing, whether, whether it's in venture capitalists or the types of entrepreneurs you've just been talking to um, because like there's a, you know there's studies out there that show that like the average age of entrepreneurs is like 45 but we're also seeing this new wave of really young entrepreneurs like really young starting out companies so what have you kind of seen and where do you what's your kind of thesis on um, I don't know what makes good entrepreneurs that's a big question um, I guess one interesting trend that I've been seeing for sure and especially having been talking to people who are younger and younger is just that the barriers to creating a company have decreased steadily over time. And that's primarily due to just the internet, and the, the accessibility of, of information. Uh, like 
back in the eighties and nineties, it was very difficult to start, to start a company. There's just like very high barriers in terms of actually going out and filing for the LLC or the C Corp, um, learning about how the industry works. Uh, there's just a ton of knowledge that you really needed to be sold, sort of an older person to access just by like talking to people and um, getting legal services and all these sorts of things. So there's an age barrier. Whereas nowadays, all of this stuff is like totally transparently available on the internet. And I've seen kids that are as young as like 14 or 15 that have created companies that are like mind-blowingly good. Um, and I think that the accessibility of information has really overall taken the the age of the average founder down significantly while not really lowering the quality in any significant way. Uh, so that's that's sort of one one thesis that I have is that just like overall the accessibility of information has made the the founding age lower. Um, and I think that you're seeing that in the quality of companies that are coming out of universities. So back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, there were good companies coming out of universities, but the number of them was relatively small. Whereas nowadays it's quite common to see really, really high tier companies and founders um, coming out of universities just because they've had more exposure at an earlier age. Uh, Right. Okay. That's one take. Um, what was the second half of your question again? I was kind of talking about, uh, yeah, where, where do you, I guess, what makes good entrepreneurs and kind of your hindsight of, it could even be in specific industry that you've been involved with. For example, maybe you're involved with music tech. Like, what do you kind of need and what do you kind of need to survive in your industry that you're either involved in or that you've seen? Yeah. Um, obviously, it's like a, a very complex set of characteristics, but I think that two of the most important things are um, either like extremely deep and detailed knowledge in a given niche that you're founding in, um, or just like a very strong generalist ability. So that's just sort of, you know, like the high IQ person that can work hard. Um, you see both of these types and in companies like as personally like ones that I've seen as well as others that have been brought in through contrary. Um, there's definitely the, like I mentioned, the second type people who are just very intelligent across the board and have a great work ethic and can grind through really any problem that comes their way and solve it efficiently and, and intelligently. And then there's also the first type, people who are just like obsessed with certain problems and have built up their technical expertise in a given area over many years and have become just complete experts. So although they may not be like all that, all that smart per se from a base level, the amount of time that they've invested has made them like very smart on a given topic. Um, so I'd say that those are like two of the, the big buckets that I would group great founders into. And uh, definitely from personal experience, I think that both work in terms of like creating longer term successful companies. But yeah, those are definitely two of the primary buckets. The generalist who's just very intelligent and can solve anything. And then the person that's very dedicated and has built up a bunch of knowledge in a specific industry. Yeah, I think you answered, you tackled that question really great actually. Um, so those are two things for our listeners to kind of keep in mind. And yeah, I think that's a really interesting viewpoint. Um, either you're very, uh, specific with a, a lot of years of experience or uh, yeah you're just a generalist who can kind of uh, take what's thrown at him and, and keep going um, yeah so we would we would love to have you back on the podcast sometime maybe further down the month uh, to see what our listeners have got from this and you know hopefully our listeners can even uh, reach out to you you know if they have some interesting projects so so people can contact you at keegan at contrarycap.com correct um, and it, it's k-e-e-g-a-n at country yep correct uh, so yeah so yeah thanks for uh thanks for giving uh us your time keegan it was really interesting to hear your viewpoints and yeah we'll let you know when it's up and hope to hear back from you soon of course guys thanks. yeah thank you so much keegan and thank you for joining us yep, appreciate it have a good one cheers, cheers. cheers. Bye -bye.